Welcome to Day 15 of Natural Beauty Summit's Detox Your Beauty Regimen Series. I'm Salome Salehi, founder and president at Sugar Sugar Wax, a clean beauty company. And today we're talking about a topic that is very personal to me. In fact, it's kind of the reason that I started my company. Today, we're talking about rosacea and compromised barrier, which is more commonly known as sensitive skin. Although the two conditions are quite different, they tend to manifest with similar symptoms, namely redness and inflammation, and so tend to be confused for one another quite regularly. Now, I've had sensitive skin pretty much my whole life, as well as periods of eczema, and I was even once diagnosed or misdiagnosed with rosacea. Although these conditions are usually discussed as facial conditions, they tend to affect the whole body, which made things like shaving, waxing, or even threading rather uncomfortable, to put it mildly. That's why when I discovered sugaring, I had to share it with the whole world. It was the only method of hair removal ever to get two thumbs up from my skin. And hence, Sugar Sugar Wax was born. Fortunately for all of us, my guest today, Shannon Esau, is all too familiar with these conditions and we'll be sharing some excellent tips on how to manage rosacea and compromise barrier. Shannon and her mom started the Rhonda Ellison line for professional and medispa use, where they not only formulate high potency groundbreaking formulas for estheticians and medical professionals, but they're also setting the standards for spas with the in-depth education and courses that they provide for the industry. Today, Shannon and I are talking about rosacea, compromised barrier, as well as other skin conditions. We're also talking at length about the role of vitamin A, which has recently become kind of a controversial ingredient, so stay tuned. Hi everyone and welcome to Natural Beauty Summit. I am here with Shannon Esau, a skincare expert who's been formulating amazing skincare products for over 20 years. And uh, today we're gonna be talking a little bit about rosacea and skin um, or compromised barrier skin. Um, and we're just gonna get right into it. Wow. Now, um, what I love about your line Shannon, is that you have been formulating for very specific conditions and sometimes even like a range within a specific condition. Mm -hmm. um, and rosacea and compromised barrier are just a couple of them, but we decided to focus on these today because they're so common and, and they're also very similar. So much so that uh, often they get like one gets mistaken for another. Yes. So I would love to hear about your experience with these conditions and what are some of your considerations when you're formulating? Yeah, well, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And certainly this is a, a great subject, like you said, because it does affect so many people. Uh, there is a difference between rosacea and having a compromised barrier or being sensitive. So you might think of sensitivities kind of fall in that compromised barrier area. When you're formulating for conditions, so to speak, you are looking at all of the different aspects. Um, so one thing is, is bringing in kind of a philosophy of what really do we need to do to this skin uh, to bring it to um, the optimum kind of optimal health that we can. Uh, so that you kind of bring that in, then you find those pieces and then you formulate inside of that. When you think about that too, kind of going forward with 
maybe different elements. Uh, so even for rosacea or compromised barrier, it's not always this is the regimen and that's gonna work for me, for you, for everyone else with this condition. And that's very important to understand and there's a couple different layers there. One is uh, potentially environment. So if I'm living in a different area, uh, dryness, altitude, humidity, all of those things impact that skin differently. And so there's ingredients that uh, may or may not work for that particular skin just based on environment. Uh, and then other elements, you know, um, from one person to another, from health standpoints, mm -hmm. uh, how oily, um, how dry is their skin just generally, uh, thickness within the skin. Uh, so there's just many other factors to take into consideration versus just, oh, they're a rosacea skin or, oh, they're a compromised barrier. Uh, so that's one of the big areas that we really try to keep in our consideration. Yeah. And um, just to kind of take a step back, can you yeah. talk about, we, talk, we touched on some of the causes a little bit um, and what like having a condition like rosacea does to the skin can, can we just like touch on like what those conditions are and maybe even how they come to be yeah i think so and i'll also sort of maybe tie in a little bit more about how um kind of what you asked me before how are they mistaken for each other yes a little bit and so when we think about um, rosacea, first of all, understanding that that is actually considered a, a disease. So rosacea is something that's internal happening in the body, um, but the signs of it are external. So there's a lot of different uh, theories, so to speak, on rosacea, whether that's bad bacteria being held kind of in the gut, things with your circulatory system can affect and just maybe not be... Um, as normal as someone else's in a sense. And so that's creating this rosacea or this redness on the epidermis. So it's something happening internally, but it affects externally. So when you're dealing with rosacea, there's a lot of factors there. You either have to focus also internally and externally to be able to really slow that down and get the results you're looking for. One other thing to kind of, or I guess two other things to say within rosacea, and this leads to why you were kind of saying maybe um, having different options for rosacea, because rosacea is different stages. So you've got mm -hmm. um, where it can progress into a stage three, um, which is like a real thickness to the skin, sometimes an overgrowth, real ruddy, and sometimes even at that stage and stage two, the skin can really hurt. Uh, it can be hurting to the touch. Um, you see redness, all of those things. So when you start to compare it with a compromised barrier, one of the similarities with rosacea and a compromised barrier is sometimes the redness in the skin. A lot of times rosacea is sensitive, okay? but compromise barrier is completely different than rosacea. It's not a disease. Uh, and so that's one kind of element. The other thing about compromise barrier is sometimes you can be compromised even for a season yeah, and you can strengthen that skin. So there's different elements. So when we think about a compromise barrier, how do we get there? What does that really mean? You get to a compromised place that could be outdoor elements, uh, being in a really harsh winter, a lot of wind, something like that that can start to break down your barrier. And then uh, medications, you know, being on a lot of medications, that can start to, you know, your health, your skin um, and your body work together. Your skin's your largest organ, but they really work together. And so when things are happening within the body, that can affect the skin and vice versa. The other thing about our skin is it's meant to keep toxins, bacteria, all of that out of the body. When it starts to become more vulnerable um, or compromised, that allows those toxins and things to get into the body. So that's another element that could be causing compromised barrier. The other kind of piece is maybe overuse. Like we think of um, overuse when I say that on maybe prescription strength topicals, sometimes like Retin-A. Uh, maybe doing a, a really aggressive medical peel or laser. I've seen people that, you know, years later, they're still very sensitive. They have this compromised kind of epidermis now. Uh, so that kind of over exfoliation, but it can get confused with rosacea because the skin sometimes is thinner, the redness, but you really have to understand. So one of the things I ask people 
is first of all, have you ever been diagnosed with rosacea? You might ask that question. Or then when did your skin start to become red or sensitive? So a rosacea, usually it's kind of like, well, it's always been that way for the most part. Or I got flushed when I was, you know, really easily. Uh, you can start to tell with foods, things like that. With a compromise barrier, people can say, oh, when I moved here, my skin yeah. started to be, you know, so that can always tell you when you ask a few questions or you think about it, you're like, oh, I think I'm more compromised. Now there's some products that go hand in hand and can work for both rosacea and a compromise barrier. But when we know, and when we can identify the difference and find them, oh, you're really truly in this place, we can get even better uh, results on the skin. I think that's a really great guide because I can't tell you how many people I talk to that are like, oh, I didn't even know I had rosacea until like so-and-so told me. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm like, that's a good way to distinguish. It's, mm -hmm. is it a disease, something that's been internal and, you know, ongoing for a long time, or is it something that's recent and maybe environmental? Yeah. Now, Speaking of environmental, let's talk about that a little bit because we touched on some things and even in this conversation, you've already uh, kind of started scratching the surface there a little bit. What are, like in your experience of dealing with these skin conditions, what are some of the like environmental toxins um, or factors like you refer to the wind and cold or harsh mm -hmm. winter or whatever? Um, that further agitate these conditions specifically? Yeah, I mean, polluted, more polluted environments, definitely uh, smoking, that will kind of, you know, uh, exaggerate or aggravate. Um, those are kind of different toxins and pollution type things. Foods we eat really come into play, uh, certainly within the body. There's a lot of different bacteria and toxins out there in our kind of natural living environment. And like I was saying, in general, our skin's meant to keep those things out. That is what the skin does when it's in a healthy place. When it's broken down uh, or, you know, wounded in some aspect, then you're going to be much more vulnerable to those things. And sometimes you can have certain health issues that a lot of times can even be from a compromised barrier on the skin because some of those uh, pollute, pollutants, so to speak, are allowed into the body uh, more than they should be. And the, you know, we're talking about a lot with the face, but really that is the whole body, yeah. Uh, you know, and taking care of you. Know, if you have a lot of really super dry skin, if you're washing your hands right now like excessively, <laughs> um, your skin can start to become a little more vulnerable uh, to the elements. And so, using um, you know uh, ingredients that can help that is going to be so important. So, there's a long, long list of kind of toxins, pollutants, and those type of things. Uh, but just generally. No one's immune from it because, um, you know, even if you're in the most healthy uh, kind of place uh, from your, what you eat and what you do, but then, you know, stress can increase that. And then, like I said, you know, um, it, just the outdoor elements can really bring a lot to that. So um, that's kind of what I would say. And there's no specific thing, like even, you know, we talk about mercury and, and those kind of things that have kind of come around and people are, oh, I don't want that um, as a toxin element. But there's nothing specific, just understanding what our skin's meant to do as a function and then how um, we're kind of attacked, so to speak, with our skin based on so many things that we do on an everyday basis. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because with like food and nutrition, we can control it, but environment is like completely out of our control. So um, I would love to hear from you a little bit about some of those um, ingredients um, that will help shield, protect, support the skin in, in like where it comes to interacting with the environment. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, certainly. And there's, there's so many, but I would focus on a few pieces and one would be antioxidants. So antioxidants are kind of our first line of defense within our skin. If we have more antioxidants, um, we have natural antioxidants in our cells and in our body. And as we're aging, that starts to decline. 
<laughs> if you're in a more uh, polluted uh, area or if you're out in the sun a lot, that's going to pull those antioxidants and kind of decline. So you want to add antioxidants um, to the skin because that's really going to help protect. Uh, and topically or ingested? So both. Um, I recommend doing, you know, I do a lot of green tea and I do that first thing in the morning and particularly if I'm going out and about because I really feel like that's going to help. Um, white tea is good too, but using, doing antioxidants, berries, things like that. Um, for your skin, same, same thing applies. If you put antioxidants on, and there's a wide variety of antioxidants, we love L-glutathione because that's naturally found within the body. Very, very powerful. Superoxide dismutase is another one. Those really work together to create a powerful duo for antioxidants. But green tea and skincare, we use the heart of green tea. That gives you more of those antioxidant properties and um, kind of the benefits of that. Uh, resveratrol, there's a long list of those. Uh, so what, and as we were talking about rosacea and compromised barrier, it's what are the antioxidants that work for that skin? Because not every antioxidant that's out there or then formulation works for everybody's skin. Okay. So that would be kind of my, my first thing is antioxidants. Um, doing things that strengthen the skin. So vitamin A is one of the key elements for that. We're going to uh, get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. So I'll leave. Yeah. I'll, okay. That sounds good because that's a big subject actually, yeah. vitamin A. Um, but that can really help. Um, and then, but if you're thinking about kind of daytime and outdoor elements that antioxidants support, uh, and then of course sunscreen. So your SPF, you want to look for, um, physical uh, protectants, not chemical. Um, that is very, very important when you're looking for sunscreen. And so zinc, titanium dioxide, those type of uh, uh, formulations, and then things that are clean ingredient decks. Because remember, when you're looking for skincare, and especially to protect you from pollutants and outdoor elements, you are, uh, what you put on your skin, and if it has, you know, parabens or other kind of toxic toxin elements, toxin element, toxic elements, that actually really does um, make a difference on the skin. And we've seen that particularly if you're compromised or rosacea. So if you're in normal skin, you may not see the effects of these ingredients that aren't so um, healthy for your skin immediately. But if you're compromised or rosacea, which is kind of somewhat of a compromise too, because it's on the epidermis, if you put inferior ingredients on that skin, you're gonna really see the difference. And so making sure you're looking for clean ingredient decks. And then one other thing I'd probably say is vitamin C. Uh, using vitamin C, uh, as we're talking about kind of rosacea compromise barrier and protecting the skin that way, uh, something like the magnesium ascorbyl phosphate, that is an amazing, vitamin C that helps sensitive skin. And what vitamin C does is it increases kind of the immunity health. So it also protects, gives more antioxidants, so it's gonna protect out there in the elements, but it's gonna help the immunity. And we were talking about that from a standpoint of health and our skin immunity is so important. So adding vitamin C, antioxidants, and SPF are really huge for protection in the elements. Oh my gosh, you are talking about like so many triggers right now. Um, I know. And we can't talk about all of them. But I know. For the sake of our audience, I just want to touch on a couple of things because I don't know if it's common knowledge, but you and I, we're in the industry and we're hearing about all the controversy around SPF and sunscreen, or sunscreen products. Yeah. Um, and what you said, I really, really want to underscore, um, there's zinc oxide and what was the second one? Titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide, which actually creates a barrier for the face yes. versus, you know, I'm not going to name names, but some of the other sunscreen ingredients, which have now really come to the attention of the FDA and mm -hmm. they're breaking that down. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully in the years to come, we can expect the FDA to be able to implement um, protocols around the use of certain ingredients in sunscreen. It's so important, guys. I'm not going to get into it, but just no. do your homework. 
Another one that you touched on, vitamin C, which I love, 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 love for so many reasons. But what I find is a lot of the vitamin Cs that are serums specifically that are in the market are breaking down before they even, the bottle opens because they're exposed to light or can you just like for one minute, just like touch on what you, the, the ingredient that you mentioned, cause that's for having a stable vitamin C ingredient is so important. This is so worth educating yourself on. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to get into vitamin A, but I'm just going to let you yeah. just do a little plug on vitamin C. Yeah. Okay. I will. And I'm so glad you mentioned the SPF side too, because you know, really, I probably maybe should have started with, it's so important. And I, so I totally agree with you on that. That's a really good point and what that does and, and how that education out there is just needed uh, because there's a lot of confusion, you know, even behind the factor of the SPF and what that looks like. So really, really good. But going into vitamin C, I would say a couple of things. One is uh, the main form of vitamin C that's been used skincare wide in the industry is L-ascorbic acid. We use that as well, but we have some different uh, things. So when we're talking about uh, kind of rosacea sensitive, that MAP, that magnesium, magnesium ascorbyl phosphate is a really phenomenal one that's more stable, but has a lot of the same capabilities. So when we think about that and what you're talking about is what happens is the, the formulations, uh, the vitamin C starts to oxidize. Um, kind of like when you think of an avocado, you open that up and the apple, same thing. And you know, you open that up as it gets in the air, it starts to brown. Well, that's this oxidation process that is not healthy for the skin okay so understanding that first and foremost is that when something is in an oxidated state it's not good for the skin it's going to increase free radicals and it's going to break the skin down and not be good so what do you do well for one, when we formulate with L-ascorbic acid, so we formulate in a, in a place where a lot of our products are not um, long, long shelf lives. And that's gonna make a difference when you're thinking of something like L-ascorbic acid, um, but also having it in a airless packaging. Yeah. So we have it in a small size and airless. Every time you open it, it's getting more and more exposed. Um, so we have it in a smaller size where that's about two months to two and a half months of use, which typically when a formulation is done with L-ascorbic acid, it usually has a shelf life six months to a year or so. But even so, even if it has that preservative wise, the L-ascorbic side that like you mentioned, even light, that will start to break down immediately as it gets air. Okay. And normally that will only last for about three months. And so you don't want, you want it to be in something that's really airtight. That's not allowing that to get in. And that's going to only last you a couple months. So that's what I would say there. However, on that flip side, there are uh, a little bit more of a stable to forms of vitamin C. And so the map is the one um, that we like to use that gives you, you can still get a 20% um, vitamin C dose to the skin, which is very important. So studies show that you can get anywhere from 15 to 25% uh, on the skin and that's what you need. Think about it like this. When you take vitamin C internally, you do not take tons and tons of vitamin C. There's regulations on how much you really should take internally. Same for our skin, okay? Um, and so that is what I would suggest is going for something that's a little bit longer uh, stable-wise, uh, you know, shelf, not shelf life, but without breaking down uh, and looking for formula like that. So I hope that answered it because it's a big subject too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. That's perfect. I think um, also uh, when people are buying skincare, I find that they tend to consult as well with, I mean, I was in Sephora. I was looking at, and this is obviously before COVID, but I was looking at some new vitamin C serums and uh, some, uh, and one sales girl was so knowledgeable and she was like, Oh, forget that one. That one's like, by the time you take it home, like it's, it's, it's useless. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sephora. Uh, <laughs> But uh, no, it's great to have that knowledge. And I think it's important to pay attention to the ingredients. Yeah, yeah, now, for sure. 
Now to get to our big subject, <laughs> vitamin A. It is such a big topic right now. And there's even some controversy around it. Vitamin A in various forms, retinol, retinoids. Um, ret I'll let you talk about the different forms. Um, but it is an important uh, element for the skin. It's very yeah. purposeful. Yeah. So if, and, and just for our audience, just so you know, at, uh, as a follow-up, we will be sharing with you a more in-depth uh, webinar on vitamin A and exploring the difference. And thank you to Shannon for sharing that with us. Because it is such a big subject, we can't cover it all right now. But if you can, Shannon, maybe give us like a little bit of a baseline of the different types and mm -hmm. the role that it plays for conditions like rosacea and compromised barrier. Yeah, certainly. And it is, you know, it's a big subject. It's, I think the webinar is about an hour or so. <laughs> so you can talk about that for quite a long time. And there is controversy over vitamin A. Uh, I believe that vitamin A is still the number one uh, kind of ingredient that we can use. So well researched. Uh, vitamin A has been around for for many, many years and uh, was kind of founded originally uh, for um, acne skin and found kind of really soon on uh, the scene how that really worked for pro-youth or aging skin. And so it's been around probably uh, kind of more in the form that you might think of Retin-A, uh, something like that, those prescription strength type of vitamin A's uh, since uh, the 40s and uh, 1940s. And so as we're going to have to start saying 19 since we're getting into 2000, we're already in 2020 here, um, which has been an interesting year, hasn't it? Yep. Um, <laughs> but um, so it has been around for a very, very long time. There's uh, what I would say is formulation is really key because when you think of vitamin A and you're kind of asking me to talk about it for, you know, sensitive compromise barrier and rosacea from that standpoint, vitamin A is all about strengthening the skin. So when we think about it, we go, well, why is so many times when I use it, either I can't use it because maybe I'm getting irritated, uh, my skin's starting to kind of even peel or get red, or if I use vitamin A tonight and I went out to uh, the beach tomorrow, is that a good thing? Most people would go, probably not, because you're looking at these formulations that, um, and it comes in with a couple different things. You've got to look at the overall formulation. So the form of vitamin A makes a huge difference then what it's formulated with makes another difference. So vitamin A starts at beta carotene. That's where it kind of initially starts. And then it converts into different um, kind of forms uh, to eventually get to a form called retinoic acid. Retinoic acid is the form that our body and our skin can then use. And what it does is it synthesizes collagen and elastin, okay? Collagen and elastin is the big thing that our skin needs. It's kind of that lower level of the skin, the dermis, uh, to really do everything, to strengthen the skin, to help new cells that come to the surface. It's going to strengthen those. You have to have this collagen and elastin. But one thing that's happening, and particularly in the skins we're talking about, is that we're losing collagen and elastin just as we age normal we're just losing it it's starting to well when we have a compromise barrier we're even losing it more rapidly because the collagen and elastin or that lower level in our skin that dermis its main function is in life is to protect the epidermis so if the epidermis is exposed at all then it's going to be pulling that collagen and elastin and all those resources okay so that's the key thing vitamin a does so when we think of these skins that need to be strengthened, we got to figure out how do we get a vitamin A on that skin that is going to be healthy, that's not going to compromise them more, and that they can really get the benefits out of it. So that's kind of where you start with your thinking process. One other key thing that I think is important with vitamin A is that it doesn't stay stored in the body. Whether you consume it or whether you apply it topically, Vitamin A is only used for a 24 hour period and then it releases itself out through the liver, through the skin, and you need more. Now your body can, uh, you know, sometimes like you have enough collagen and elastin, it's able to synthesize, but generally you have to put that into the body or on the skin in order to get more of it. So if we think about that 24 hour kind of thought process, 
what I like to do is explain to people that there's what I would call a lifestyle friendly vitamin A. And this is something that I can get on the skin every night, maybe every other night for some, it just depends. Uh, well, what does that mean and how does that work? So when you look at vitamin A in general, think about it from that standpoint. Can I get this on the skin every night or every day? Because if I can only get it on once a week, if I apply it every night, and it makes my skin red and kind of peely and everything like that. Um, what am I doing for the other nights? And is that really, so this gets really deep and so I probably need to stop because <laughs> if you really get into that exfoliation piece with the skin, are you really then putting more collagen and elastin in? So that's a whole nother subject. I do think I cover that in that webinar. But so let me sort of go back to now these forms, okay? So I talked about beta carotene. I talked about how that eventually gets to retinoic acid. There's two forms that are primarily used that are kind of what are considered natural forms of vitamin A, different than your prescription strength. And one is retinol and one is retinaldehyde. So either one of those forms can be really healthy for the skin. The main thing you have to look for is what else is it formulated with? So when I say that, what I mean is, okay, if you've got a vitamin A, let's say a retinaldehyde or a retinol, and it's formulated then with maybe a lactic acid. Lactic acid can be real healthy for certain skins or a glycolic, maybe a salicylic acid, something like that. Those paired together, that is going to in itself bring the epidermis cells into maybe dryness or somewhat of a peeling state. Uh, if you're looking for something that's not going to expose, so whenever you do that, if I'm doing something like that, then I don't want to go out to the beach the next day, right? So uh, on a flip side, if I'm trying to use vitamin A every night, I'm looking for something that's formulated with maybe a stem cell, maybe a peptide, those kind of elements. So peptides help to stimulate collagen and elastin too. They do it by signaling different than synthesizing. They kind of tell that, let's synthesize. They're like going, hey guys, let's do this, you know, something like that. So they're giving back to the skin that way. Stem cells, they help to repair damage. They help to repair certain things and elements. They have a lot of, there's a lot of different properties within stem cells. I mean, they can reduce redness. They can, it depends on what it is. So combining something like that with the vitamin A then becomes what I would say is a lifestyle friendly. So you can put that on a skin that's compromised on a rosacea and it's just going to start helping that skin from a nutrient place to really build and thicken that skin and really be a huge pro youth. So that skin can age a little more gracefully too, because as you know, we're all aging, but how do you do that with some, you know, we think aging is, uh, you know, peels and everything else, and that's going to get us there, but a compromised barrier, you can't do that in a rosacea skin a lot of times. So using something like that. So a retinaldehyde form, and retinaldehyde is a really phenomenal form that converts to retinoic acid. So, so does retinol. So it converts on its own. So when you apply it to the skin, it can convert and then the skin cells recognize it and can start to use it. Um, so that's maybe as short as I can get it kind of, yeah. and hopefully that helps. I, mean, I think um, one thing I'd like to underscore from what you said is paired with the stem cells, um, on the compromised barrier, the skin gets to have the benefits from the retinol, but also it is healing at the same time. So it's yes. kind of battling that fight with um, the compromised barrier at the same time. Yes, most definitely. And we, we also like to use an encapsulation process with our vitamin A and, and many ingredients. So what that does, and we'll get into a lot of things here because that can be kind of in depth too. But what encapsulation does is it helps to drive the ingredient deeper into uh, the layers of the skin. So it's really, really good to use kind of an encapsulated retinaldehyde piece because that'll take the, the vitamin A further. But yeah, stem cells are phenomenal. And that's another subject <laughs> that can take a while. <laughs> we could talk all day. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about, um, well, you are formulating, your products are mainly going into spas and medi spas. And um, for that kind of use, it's really intended to have like maximum um, impact mm -hmm. and your concentrations I'm sure are higher. Now, now that we're in COVID and um, 
we are not having our like monthly or yearly visit to the spa, um, what can you kind of suggest in terms of daily skincare regimen um, that is, I guess, not depending on that big boost? Mm -hmm. And what, what, do our, what does our skin need like on a daily versus weekly versus monthly mm -hmm. basis? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that can be a wide range of things to answer that. But ultimately what I would say is that you need to have, you know, a cleanser that's very healthy for the skin because cleansing is one of the most important things that you can do. And many people under cleanse and over moisturize the skin. We find that all the time. And that is not healthy for the skin. So you really want to do a really good cleanser. And then you want to give the skin during the day antioxidants. That can be different from a compromise barrier of an antioxidant formulation to a maybe a normal pro use skin or even someone with acne or you know so you got to find that for that skin but give that skin antioxidants to help the environment and then certainly your SPF and hydration comes in so you want to do that in the AM and then in the PM you want to do what we would call rejuvenation so talking today about the skins we are rejuvenation is lifestyle friendly rejuvenation something that is not going to create inflammation or exfoliation so sometimes we can get exfoliation from certain types of formulas that maybe are meant to be used just a couple times a week and they give that skin a little dryness, maybe a, you know, kind of a mini home care pill, so to speak. With the skins we're talking about today, we really want to minimize that. So we want to use rejuvenation products or formulations and ingredients that help to not bring the skin into that inflammation and exfoliation. So again, you're cleansing at night, doing something rejuvenation style, uh, retinaldehyde, uh, mandelic acids, really, really good, something like that. And then going into hydration. So what do you need uh, PM? Do you need something that's really lipid based? Um, how is your skin from a standpoint of hydration? And add that at night. It can really be three simple steps. So you're kind of keeping that in as the health of your skin. And then weekly, you can do home care uh, home facials. Um, there's a lot of different uh, gentle enzymes. There's a little bit stronger enzymes, really nutrient dense mask um, and serums that you could do. You can do that on a weekly basis and keep your skin in a very healthy place. That's awesome. I think those are such great tips. And, you know, sometimes I think we can get overwhelmed or overwhelm our skin with too many products. But from what you're saying, it's just a few key steps and making sure that you're doing what's right for your skin at the right time. Um, and any tips on like how not to overwhelm the skin? Cause you kind of touched on like yeah. too much moisture and not enough cleansing. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, so when you're first starting out with any regimen and particularly like you mentioned our products being uh, kind of the higher concentration and the way that they're sold and they're really men. I mean, everything that we formulate and develop is to make a change on the skin. We don't really take, um, maybe key buzzwords in a sense and kind of go there. We're really focused in on the overall formula, what that's going to do and if that's going to make a change on the skin. So when you kind of think about that um, from what we're talking about with the skins today, uh, less is more. Mm -hmm. Being simple in that regimen is going to really help that skin. If you introduce too many elements, and even on a normal skin, that sometimes can cause that skin to maybe even break out, uh, to get a little, you know, strange, maybe have some sensitivities and go through that because our skin's very reactive. Our skin is a live organ and we have to remember that, that that's what we're putting on and on our skin. And so I would say less is more, simple, one, two, three steps here and there, uh, you know, and following the guidelines of leaving those skin irritants out of your formulations, particularly for these skins, but kind of even across the board. And that is things like synthetic fragrances, uh, certain dyes. You oh, know, they you're hitting kind of all the notes. <laughs> parabens, uh, you know, stuff like that, that you don't want in your formula, really looking at that and, and going for those clean ingredient decks and simple. And so that's what I would say the most is keep your regimen simple in the beginning and then add to it as you need. 
you That's know? Awesome. That's a great tip and the perfect um, segue into our finality. Um, thank you so much, Shannon, for all that you've shared. And for our audience, um, Shannon is actually um, giving three lucky um, viewers uh, the Rosacea Rescue uh, Duo from her line, which is, um, can you talk a little bit about the duo? Because I think like, yeah, if you're not Rosacea, it's, it's, it's such a great formula. Well, actually, yeah, this will work on pretty much anyone's skin. I was going to go to that exact duo over here, but this duo is, um, it's called um, our stem cell repair. And so this has our Synergy A and then our C stem cell. And we have the same uh, kind of formulation and duo for our compromised skins as well as our rosacea skins. And what this is, is that vitamin A we discussed. So it's an encapsulated retinaldehyde and it's formulated with stem cells in the Synergy A. So it's gonna be very healing, uh, very pro youth. I actually use both of these products on my skin because I'm a rosacea and I didn't mention that. A lot of times when I talk about rosacea, I kind of mention my own skin, but we didn't go down all that. Um, but I'm rosacea skin and have had to really kind of find that throughout the years um, of those kind of formulations that can help me as I'm aging, not just control the rosacea, but then also help my skin as I'm getting older, right? And so this is where that comes in to bring, be very strengthening for the skin, very reparative. And then you've got this vitamin C, uh, which uses that uh, magnesium ascorbyl phosphate that we've mentioned and it's in a, a phospholipid complex. And what that does for sensitive rosacea type skins is it creates a barrier. So it's gonna help with those ingredients to go deeper into the skin and also bring some hydration. So it's a perfect duo for repair, for pro you to kind of help with the aging of the skin and then just strengthen the skin overall. That is awesome. And guys, if that wasn't enough, she is also sharing with us a one hour webinar for free. Um, the link is in the email. So you'll get that link. And, uh, and it's just exploring retinol or yeah. vitamin A. Yeah. Um, it's exploring retinoids, the differences. And this is such a timely topic. And the, the, although the content was actually created for professionals, um, who right now should and would be in the spas taking care of our faces. Uh, I think, you know, right now we're stuck at home and we're kind of left to our own devices. This is a great way to uh, empower yourself with a very important topic and just understand. Because, um, you know, our skin, like you've mentioned several times, is it's our largest living organ and we have to respect it and really take care of it. So thank you, Shannon. Thank you for being with us and for sharing. Any final thoughts? No, I thank you. I appreciate you inviting me to do this. And um, I just hope everyone stays healthy out there and increases your skin health. It's the number one thing you can do for your body and your skin. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Thank guys. you. Thanks for joining us.